Well, um, this evening we will continue and finish our lesson on the sacraments and the sacramental ministry of the church. Um, last week we, we covered a great deal of material as far as what sacramental theology is, and this week we will be uh, uh, zeroing in on the um, particular sacraments, the, each of the seven. So we'll look at each one of them and, um, and examine those, uh, and that will be our lesson for this evening. Uh, you do know there are seven sacraments. Um, I do want to remind you that um, um, when we speak of the seven sacraments, this is the seven normative sacramental uh, actions of the church, and that these, uh, it, it, these have been recognized and affirmed by the church through the centuries, and it's they're readily identifiable. However, this is not an exhaustive list because um, there, are all other, there are other kinds of sacramental moments um, that occur in the ministry of the church. These are the seven ordinary ones um, that we can easily identify and recognize. But everything the church does, um, for the most part, um, is sacramental because the sacraments are the uh, continuing work of Christ within the context in and through the church itself. And um, we did talk about, I want to remind you, that um, Christ is the, himself and his very person is the preeminent sacrament. Um, and so Christ is, can be called the sacrament of God. Then the church itself is a sacrament and it is uh, been called the sacrament, the church is the sacrament of Christ. And then there are the activities, the ministerial activities of the church, which are the sacraments. And I think this is a really important development of, of thought because it uh, connects the sacramental ministry of the church with the incarnation. And so, uh, as we think of Jesus be, being the embodiment of God, God becoming flesh, or the Word of God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus in history, so the activity of God, or the activity of Christ, or the activity of the Blessed Trinity um, is, becomes incarnate to us through these sacramental actions. Um, so the sacraments are a type of incarnation or enfleshment where the grace of God, the work of God is made material for us and is perceived through the five senses, through the sacramental matter, the matter being water or oil, depending on what the sacrament is. <clears throat> so um, if you go to page six, I believe it's page six, and we are at se on section F, in which we are going to identify uh, the seven sacraments. Are you there with me in your worksheets? Okay, good. Um, now, the seven sacraments have traditionally been divided into um, three subsets. Yes? They Yeah, I think I just gave you the, but is it the... Um, So the sacraments, the seven sacraments, are further divided into uh, subcategories. Um, and the first category we're going to look at is what is called the sacraments of initiation. Sacraments that introduce us and lead us into the continuing life of the church. Two of those sacraments, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of confirmation, um, are non-repeatable. In other words, um, they happen once in time. However, the effect and the work of that sacrament is continuous. So even though you were baptized at a particular moment in time, um, and the church is very um, reluctant to rebaptize anyone um, because it's a sacrament once given 
and, it, and, the, and the effects of that sacrament or the work of that sacrament continues to unfold in one's life. Um, so typically we do not rebaptize anyone. Yes? Uh, you said doesn't like to rebaptize. Or is reluctant to. Reluctant. So what are the circumstances that you would rebaptize? Well, um, uh, some people, uh, well, for, let me give you an example. Let's say there was someone who was baptized in the Methodist Church. Like the, like the cameraman, or the Lutheran church. Um, if it, now, they have made the transition into formally affiliating or joining a Catholic church. Um, this would have been true if they joined the Roman Catholic church. It's certainly true here in the context of the ecumenical Catholic communion. And so we would recognize their baptism. So a Methodist can become a Catholic without being baptized again because the criteria is very clear in Catholic theology. Um, as long as water is used, and that's the matter, and the form, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which expresses the intention, then the minister of baptism is expressing the intention of the church, therefore it is what we call a valid sacrament. In other words, it's really baptism. So it's an interesting thing, even though the Roman Catholic Church historically has refused to recognize so much of what other churches do, when it comes to baptism, this is how seriously they take uh, baptism, that if it fulfills that criteria, um, then it is a valid baptism. The only time that in the Roman Catholic Church, and it would be true in the Ecumenical Catholic Church, uh, that we would rebaptize someone is if there was some doubt whether or not the person was really baptized or that it was done correctly following that criteria. Um, so if someone was baptized at Corona Del Mar <laughs> for Calvary Chapel and decided to join St. Matthew's and become a Catholic Christian, mm -hmm. we would recognize the baptism that took place there. And that would be true of just about every Protestant body, yes. Since, although it would be extraordinary, a lay person can also baptize, it would not be necessary for a minister or a pastor in another denomination to have orders that are accepted by the Roman Catholic Church in order for the baptism to be regarded as valid. That, that is correct. A lay person, in, according to Catholic theology, can administer the sacrament of baptism. And if they use water and say the words and express the intentionality of the church, then it, it is valid. Um, so the only reason to rebaptize someone um, in the guidelines of the Roman Catholic Church would be because there is some doubt about. Uh, somebody said. Don't even remember. The, Nobody said I was. Right. That that's right, and we perhaps there's no record of it, and you yeah. were too young to remember, or uh, um, there's some doubt as to whether or not it was done correctly. So what that when when a baptism occurs in that situation, then um, it's what they call a conditional baptism. In the event that your baptism wasn't valid the first time. We're going to do this to cover that. Yeah. Now, um, this does not preclude renewing your baptisms, like if you go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and you're baptized in the Jordan River. We would see that as a renewal of your baptism. I, need just, I know these are funny distinctions, but it's not like a second baptism. It's, it's seen always connected when you were first baptized. Um, in a sense, we do this with the, um, when you bless yourself with holy water, you're coming into the church, you're renewing your baptism. When there is a rite of sprinkling, you're renewing your baptism. We do it in a fairly dramatic fashion here on Easter, when everyone has the water of the newly blessed baptismal water in the font, remember that, and you bless yourself in the name of the Holy Trinity, you are renewing your baptism. So it is, that in that case, it's called a conditional baptism. Um, uh, and other sacraments can be done conditionally. For example, confirmation uh, um, can be done conditionally if there's some doubt about that. 
um, you were confirmed in the Lutheran Church, uh, and yet you were confirmed here. And, and the reason why is because, uh, unlike baptism, um, confirmation it, it, it is not always recognized across lines because of our understanding of confirmation. Um, in the case of uh, Lutheran confirmation, the Lutheran Church does not recognize confirmation as being a sacrament. So that raises all kinds of doubts as to its validity if we think of it as a sacrament. So uh, it would not be unusual. You could have been, were you confirmed in the Lutheran Church? Ten yeah. Uh, what's that? It takes two years. Yeah, yeah. You got it here. In the uh, you were fast tracked. We 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 wanted to get you confirmed before you had any doubts. <laughs> so so um, I, does a Methodist church practice confirmation? The same thing. So uh, so then w because we understand it as a sacrament, that's why you had to go through the sacrament of confirmation to be uh, in a way that was recognizable as being valid. In the case uh, of Meredith, who is going to ex have a renewal of her uh, confirmation, because you were confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church, and, and that's a valid confirmation. So, um, but you have asked to have a, uh, to experience it again, so we would see it as a renewal of the confirmation already took place um, for pastoral reasons. So, you know, when we say for pastoral reasons, that gives us a lot of leeway. I mean, we have the rule, but pastoral way is a way of applying that rule or adapting to that rule to a particular life situation. And that's what we would be doing in your particular case. So uh, baptism is, a uh, co is one of the sacraments of initiation um, because it's through baptism that you really enter into the life of the church. The sacrament through which the grace of God, baptism, oh yeah, sacraments of initiation, that's what you want to put there. This is the uh, a subheading of three of the sacraments. Baptism is the sacrament through which the grace of God is communicated to us by removing the condition of death and restoring us to us the divine life. I put the emphasis on what you are receiving, not what is being removed. This marks the beginning of the saving process, the saving process that will continue to unfold in one's life. So, for example, when an infant is baptized, and I suspect, Steve, you were baptized as an infant, then um, we recognize that the Holy Spirit has been imparted, even though you didn't know what was going on, the Holy Spirit has been imparted to you, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and then that grace that came from your baptism continued to work out in your life, even if you were not aware of it. And so the very fact that you ended up uh, having a kind of spiritual awakening in your life in recent years, and you started coming to St. Matthew's, and now you're like this uh, weekly communicant, and you're engaged in your faith, we would see that as the fruit of the baptism. So you, it was already there, the grace was already there through the sacrament of baptism, and, but it took years for it to work, work itself out, and it continues to work. So even though baptism is an event that takes place at a particular time and location, um, the effects, the work of baptism, the grace that comes from baptism, continues to work out in one's life. So, uh, so uh, this marks the beginning of the saving process that will continue to unfold in one's life. And that's certainly what we have been able to observe in, since you've been coming here. And that's true for all of you. Um, um, in baptism, we receive, the word is receive, the Holy Spirit into our lives. In baptism, we are born again. So the Catholic understanding of the born again experience actually occurs in and through the waters of baptism. We enter into a new kind of life, a new and spiritual life. C, in baptism we are incorporated, we are incorporated into the mystical body of Christ, the church. So all of this is happening to you and you're totally oblivious of it if you were an infant. Um, 
those who uh, have not, were not baptized as infants and it happens later in adult life, um, that's kind of neat because they can, ha they, they can be fully conscious to what is happening to them. And um, so, uh, the minister of the sacrament of baptism is the apostle of Christ, the bishop. Or, and this is the, this is the caveat, <laughs> whomever the bishop may designate, may designate. So, for most people, ordinarily, a priest or deacon is the designated representative of the bishop. So when a priest or a deacon is the minister of baptism, they're doing so because they have, uh, on behalf of the bishop, because the bishop can't be everywhere, baptize everyone. So they are designated by virtue of their ordination. So um, a, a deacon, a priest can prepare a family for baptism and just do it. They don't have to go keep going back asking permission. They, the, their ordination is their delegation. Now, in extraordinary circumstances, a layperson can uh, um, uh, administer uh, the rite of baptism. So you never know when you'll be called upon to baptize someone. Um, in ordinary life, this doesn't seem to happen but on the battlefield um, you know. you, you'll, you'll see th this this kind of thing happen um, <clears throat> so, um, so so that way baptism is really readily available so um, the anyone can be an extraordinary what we call an extraordinary or extraordinary minister of the sacrament of baptism under special circumstances as long as the two other essentials of the sacrament are present. That is, the matter of the sacrament of baptism, which is water, and the form of the sacrament of baptism, which are the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Intentionality is important. It is expressed by the words so that what you are doing is in keeping with the will of the church. For, for, for the baptism. Are you with me so far? Good. Now I want to bring your attention to another document that I have given you, another supplemental um, handout. Do you have this one? It's called the Sacrament of Baptism. Because I want to develop this a little further for you. And I hope you don't mind. I'm going to read through this material. And uh, for those who are uh, watching the recording, this material is available to you and can be sent to you. Um, the Sacrament of Baptism. Baptism is a ritual ablution or purification rite practiced by ancient peoples in preparation for entering into the sacred dwelling of a deity or deities such as a temple or a shrine. The priests or priestesses, because there were many priestesses in the ancient world, of ancient cults commonly practiced these ceremonial washings in order to be ritually pure when coming into the presence of a divine being. So, it, 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 it had nothing to do with hygiene, because they didn't understand that back in the ancient world. But they did believe that there was, you just can't just walk into a presence of a divine being. You need to be prepared for that. And one of the ways of preparing that is ablution. Ablutions are purification rites with water that are used. And so many, uh, uh, this is a very common practice with many religions. The Greeks did this, the Egyptians did this. So ablutions were not something unique to um, Christianity, yes. So at the wedding feast of Cana, yes, they were all the jars with water for ritual ablutions. Yeah. So how would that have worked? Would it be just their hands? Yeah, they had uh, very elaborate uh, ceremonial washings. You before you ate, you had to give thanks for your food. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to pray to give thanks for your food, you would wash your hands in a certain way to okay. be ritually pure or clean. Like what happens on the altar. When Exactly, and that's a good example because you'll notice at the celebration of the Mass that the priest will go uh, um, to the servers and the servers will be there with a pitcher and a towel and they, that's an ablution, you know. 
um, because the priest is, and the reason why the priest does that is that the priest is going to be handling the body and blood of Christ. But that's done over and over and over. Yeah, that's not a baptism, but it is a good example of what an ablution is. And you could say it is a kind of sacramental action, but it's not, has nothing in particular to do with baptism. But baptism begins as a universal ritual that you find in many religions in the ancient world, and it's basically a ritual ablution before you enter into a temple and shrines, and there were many of them all over the ancient world. Um, notice that, that um, the religion of Israel that developed, that's recorded for us in the Bible, was it had some unique features, but it also shared a lot in common with the cultures around them at that time. So a lot of these ideas about ritual purification is fairly universal. So, the, yeah. so uh, John the Baptist? Yes, the that's exactly right. And, and you'll see that in a moment. Yeah, I, I, I do make mention of that. But what John the Baptist does um, is he's a prophet. We all know that. What seems to be lesser known to most people is that John the Baptist was also a priest. Now, prophets did not typically, as a part of their prophetic ministry, do ablutions or ritual washings, but priests most certainly did. So it's interesting that John the Baptist uses a priestly action, a, a sacred bathing, an ablution, or a, a purification rite, but he takes it on and uses it prophetically. But when you think and when you realize that he was a priest, that seemed like a natural thing for him to do. Although he was not doing, celebrate, doing baptisms for, a, a, in his role as a priest, but he did so as a prophet. And more on that in a moment. Um, the people and, the pre, and priests of Israel also practiced such rituals of purification in preparation of coming into the tabernacle, that's the sacred dwelling for the Lord uh, that Moses had built, um, and it was a much more temporary building, although it was used for centuries. And later the Temple of Jerusalem, which was built by Solomon, to offer sacrifice to the God of Israel. Later the Jews continued this practice for themselves, as well as for initiating proselytes or converts into the Jewish community. So if someone wanted to convert to Judaism, um, there, were, there was a process for doing that, and part of that process was baptism a ritual bath. Uh, the Essene community along the Dead Sea, we, 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 archaeologists have uncovered their dwellings and their communities, and there were a lot of baptismal pools. So the Essenes, who were Jewish, practiced ablutions and wishful bathing, and it was also used to bring converts into the Jewish community. If you were a male, you would have been circumcised but also you would have been baptized. So the Christians were not unique in, in baptizing new converts. The Jews were already doing it. It's a very Jewish practice in this case. Um, so um, later the Jews continued to practice themselves as well uh, as for initiating proselytes, that's converts into the Jewish community. Analogies of Jewish baptism were seen in their ancestors passing through the waters of the Red Sea during the Exodus. You know that story. So the reason they would baptize Gentiles is that a Gentile who is baptized is somehow united with that historic event that all Jewish Jews feel they share in. And it's like they're passing through the Red Sea out of slavery into the freedom of being a Jew. Um, so th this was a way of them thinking of it in, ter in an analogous way. So, uh, uh, so they, the analogies of Jewish baptism were seen in their ancestors passing through the waters of the Red Sea, that's kind of a baptism, during the Exodus, as well as in the passing through the waters of the Jordan River in their ancestral entrance into the Promised Land. So baptism was not merely for the individual, but was also seen as a communal experience. They all participate in it. Now we come to John the Baptist. John the Baptist made use of the practice of the rite of baptism that already existed by making it a prophetic sign of repentance and purification from sins in preparation for the coming of the Lord in the person of the Messiah. So John the Baptist reinterprets 
the rite of baptism as being something that removes the guilt of sin. Um, when it was used as a purification rite, it wasn't seen as washing away sins. It, didn't, it was just about um, ritual purification as you enter into the presence of the divine being. But John the Baptist connects it with this notion of preparing uh, and turning away from your sins in preparation for the coming of the Lord. Notice that baptism is something that is used uh, in the ancient world, is something you do in preparation for coming into the divine presence. Well, John the Baptist says the Lord is coming and you gotta get ready. And one of the ways you get ready is to go through this ritual bath. Um, so, uh, so John the Baptist is quoted in three of the Gospels as saying, I am baptizing you with water, purification rite, but one mightier than I is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Isn't that interesting? So, something happens that is uh, with the coming of Jesus that transforms John's baptism into something else. Yes? Is that fire the fire from Pentecost? What's that? The fire baptizes you with the well, Holy Spirit and fire. Well, let me be absolutely honest with you. We're not really sure. <laughs> but it, there is that connection. It, it, uh, so people would say, oh, that must be the Holy Spirit. And we do have the clothing tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. And the fire has become a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So, um, so and, and the fact that he says the Holy Spirit and fire, the fire, the pillar of fire is, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It was before the New Testament. Remember when the children of Israel were being led around the wilderness? They were being led by the Holy Spirit, which was called the, she the Shekinah glory. And at night it appeared as a pillar of fire. And during the day it was a pillar of smoke. So there is that association with the Spirit. Okay. Um, in, in the baptism of Jesus, this is where something changes. In the baptism of Jesus, the purification rite of baptism is transformed into the means by which one receives the life of God, the Holy Spirit. So now baptism is no longer viewed as just being the removal from dirt from the body or a purification, but rather it is the m moment in which something is imparted. And it's based upon the experience of Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, he had the vision of heaven opening and the Holy Spirit coming upon him. So what John did to baptism in the experience of Jesus, it goes much more further in a radical direction. So it's better to think of baptism more as an impartation of the Spirit than it is merely the removal of an impurity like original sin. Although that is true, it certainly does those kinds of things, but um, in the Western church, both Catholic and Protestant, they tended to think of baptism more upon what it removed than what it imparted. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you might have heard, oh, why, do, why be baptized to remove original sin? Yeah. Okay, all right, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go into all the reasons that's problematical, but it misses the point because it's really about the impartation of the Spirit. That's what's really going on. <clears throat> okay. So, in bap the baptism of Jesus, the purification rite of baptism is transformed into the means by which one receives the life of God, the Holy Spirit. Why do we say that? Because that was Jesus' experience. For this reason, baptism becomes the normative way in which one is born again into the life of the Spirit and becomes a participating member of the community of Jesus, the church. And then I quote from 1 Corinthians from Paul, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. That's how you become a part of the community of Jesus. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons. By the way, that's shocking what Paul's saying. We're so used to hearing it. Um, because it's so radically inclusive. And we were all given to drink of one spirit. And elsewhere, Peter proclaims, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here the idea of John the Baptist and the, and the experience of Jesus are combined. 
For the promise is made to you and to your children, to those far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. Then in baptism, we are, uh, Paul goes on to develop what also happens in baptism. In baptism, we are united with Christ in his death and resurrection. We who are bapt were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in newness of life. So not only is the Holy Spirit imparted upon an individual in baptism, but also that person uh, in, in, in spirit, soul, and body somehow is brought into union with the Christ event. They're united with Christ in his suffering, death, and his resurrection. Yes, uh, Diane. I want to go back up to the prior paragraph. Uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. There are some um, marginal, I will say, uh, Protestant denominations that baptize only in the name of Jesus. So if, yeah. if you come from that type of a denomination, it would be necessary for you to be baptized again yeah. in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You, you, it, the wrong words were used. Yeah, that would not be a baptism recognized. But they're basing it on this, but the Catholic Church, and historically the Church has chosen to go with the Trinitarian formula. And because this is Peter speaking, mm -hmm. and Peter can be mistaken, but when Jesus commands us to baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, well, we'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, uh, to give you an idea how this is Peter's statement, and, that, and it's just fine. It's not a problem. They did that. But Peter had this nice little tidy formula. But then later on in the book of Acts, people received the Holy Spirit before they were even baptized. <laughs> And then Peter says, well, I guess since they received the Holy Spirit, we might as well baptize them. But, you know, so, you know, uh, you, you got to be very careful with what Peter says uh, in his um, preaching in the book of Acts, because sometimes later his preaching is contradicted. Well, this was Peter's understanding at that moment. And, of course, who's to argue with Peter? The fact of the matter is he ended up baptizing 3,000 people at once. So his proclamation was quite effective. Okay, yes, and uh, Tony was, oh, you, oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay, um, so uh, Paul uh, mentions that something more is going on in baptism. Not only are we receiving the gift of the Spirit, which we are, but we are being united with Christ in his suffering, death, and resurrection. Through baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit who bears witness that we have been given a new identity. We become the children of God. You receive the spirit of adoption through which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit herself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is an interesting statement because what happened at the baptism of Jesus? The vision and the voice saying, you are my son. So the coming of the Spirit happens in Jesus' baptism and there's the witness that he is the Son of God. We, when we are baptized, are given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit in your inner sanctum of your soul and your heart bears witness, you are a child of God. So what happened to Jesus happened to you. <clears throat> That's the connection. So just as the Spirit bore witness to Jesus that he was the Son of God at his baptism, so the Spirit wit bears witness that we are the children of God through our own baptism. In baptism, we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, which is the first installment of our inheritance towards redemption as God's possession to the praise of His glory. So in other words, I don't know if store, uh, big department stores do this, but remember the day, maybe they still do, where you could get purchase things by a layaway plan? Mm -hmm. yeah. They still do that? Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, well, I, I remember that you would, I, I go in there and I wanted to get something. I didn't have the money for it, but I really wanted that thing. The store would say, that's fine. You just put down a minimal payment and make payments and then it's yours. Um, it's like an installment plan. Well, it's the exact same language here. This is God's layaway plan. So God gives you the Holy Spirit as the first payment and, uh, and you'll be fully redeemed at the second coming and the day of the resurrection. So you are in the process, you're in God's installment plan. <laughs> you're on God's layaway plan. <laughs> As a way of kind of um, getting an idea of what Paul's saying here. So, it, 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 so the seal of the Holy Spirit upon your heart is like a deposit. Um, what do they call that? An earnest? That, Over earnest money. Yeah, and so God's going to come back and finish the deal. This is why we think of it as a pro salvation as a process. What God has, the, the good work God has begun to you will be brought to completion. We're right now in that in-between time. It's not yet been fully completed because I'm still in this mortal body. But yet, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the evidence that the, it, the process has begun. Okay? I hope you're having a good time. Okay, <clears throat> Jesus commissioned his disciples, that's the church, to baptize. Jesus approached them and said to them, All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, or all ethnic groups, or uh, ethnos is the Greek word that is being here. Um, or uh, uh, in Latin it's gentiles, or all Gentiles. So in other words, he's saying make disciples of everybody baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So hopefully this supplemental handout is useful for you in better developing what baptism is. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, now we'll go to confirmation. Okay, Steve, pay attention. This is going to happen to you. <laughs> Yes. Bishop Peter, I would like to make a, a comment about some of our Protestant brothers and sisters because I think it's important for everyone to understand um, that from a Catholic perspective, baptism does something when you experience the act of baptism. There are, funda I'll call them fundamentalist denominations out there that think that you need to have some sort of a personal experience of the presence of Christ happen to you experientially. And then you go and you're baptized, and, but the baptism is not what does anything. It's simply a, a sign that you've already had this yeah. experience. Yeah. And, and, and so I think we have to be, you, you just need to be aware of that because that clearly is not where a Catholic understanding of baptism lies. And the idea that a child can be baptized means that God's grace is operating with you from the time you're baptized forward. Yeah. As, a, as opposed to thinking that you have to have some kind of a notable experience as an adult or a young adult and then a baptism occurs simply as a sign that you've had that type of experience. That, that, that's a really good point. Um, the um, majority of Protestants practice infant baptism and believe that, that that grace is imparted and that's how, so they're not too different from Catholics in that way. Um, however, there is a strain of Protestantism um, that came out of the same century, the 16th century. They were called Anabaptists. And um, the, the direct descendants of the Anabaptists, and Anabaptists meant those who baptize again, because in Europe, in the 16th century, everybody was baptized as a baby. So, and, and the Anabaptists, um, who are uh, called, uh, today they're called Amish or Mennonites, they thought no because the child had no choice in the matter so they uh, had this notion of what is called believer's baptism and that you have to make a decision 
and then you are baptized. And the baptism is just the witness that you made the decision. So there's no sense of grace coming through the baptismal waters. Um, but that is a minority Protestant. But it seems like a lot more Protestants do that because in the United States, the majority of Protestants come from that Anabaptist tradition. Although the biggest Protestant denomination, the United Methodist Church, baptizes infants. So they probably had the same explanation that, it, that grace is given and then, it, then you, it's your responsibility to do something about this gift that was given to you. Is that? Right. Okay. And the parents and godparents. And the godparents and parents uh, make a commitment. As, as does the entire church. As the entire church, yeah. So in other words, people who practice infant baptism would say, will, will say that um, when God saves his people, we don't leave the babies in Egypt. <laughs> they come too. They're a part of the church also. Okay. Yes, uh, Polly. Baptists. Do they baptize? Baptists uh, uh, do what is called believer's baptism, which is the Anabaptist idea. And that's why they're called Baptists. Baptist yeah. They come out of that same thing. When, when they do what's called an altar call, yeah. like a saddleback or a, a place like that, what uh, is that just somebody submitting to the fact that they're you know they, they want to be part of the community and that, is that that kind of the, how that works? Well, and, and the I, the practice of an altar call in evangelical Protestantism is a very American practice, and it came out of the Great Awakening in the 1700s, and then later there was a second Great Awakening in the 1800s. Um, it's hard for us t to realize how important those historical events were in the development of our country. Um, the Great Awakening was so widespread, it was like everybody was caught up into it. And we've, we've never experienced anything like that in our country since then. But it's like a revival that spreads and everybody is, uh, is hearing the gospel preached and then the, the evangelist or the preacher will invite them to come forward uh, in what is called an altar call um, and to uh, publicly bear witness that they are committing their lives to Jesus as your personal savior. And then for many evangelicals, baptism would follow that, that experience. But, but that's kind of what she was talking about. Uh, Calvary Chapel, um, Baptist churches, a lot of Pentecostal churches fall into that practice and that, that tradition. What was always interesting to me, Baptist churches don't have altars in them, and yet they're called altar calls. <laughs> There's still a residue of Catholicism in the Protestant churches. It's funny, it's funny to observe that. Um, so if you go to, uh, and so what you have in American Christianity is what we call revivalism. Um, and uh, we had two great um, awakenings. One was in this early 1700s prior to the American Revolution. The name most associated with that is Jonathan Edwards. Have you heard the name Jonathan Edwards? Comes from New England, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. and you're from Connecticut, right? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Sorry. Close. Yeah, close. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and then the, uh, George Whitfield is also, and the Wesleys were associated with that revival. In the 1800s, after the American Revolution, there was a second revival that hit the whole um, English-speaking world. It's called the Second Great Awakening. And, um, and, and, and they, 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 you had tent revivals and camp meetings and pre dramatic preachers would preach and they would, people would be very, they were very emotional and they were called to repent and to come forward, mm -hmm. the altar call to accept Christ as their savior. And this is something that's been carried on into the 20th century and even into the 21st century. Billy Graham is a revivalist preacher in that tradition. Before him, it was Billy Sunday. Before him, it was Dwight L. Moody. And this really shaped a lot of American thinking. And, um, and, and, and so uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. But it's part of what makes American Christianity rather unique compared to European Christianity. Was Elmer, I know it's a movie, but Elmer, Elmer Gantry. 
Is yeah. This part of that second. Yeah, that uh, the the, the uh, Alma Gantry is like I think take the story takes place in the twentieth century, yeah. early twentieth century, but it comes out of that revivalism, and for Americans that seems like normal Christianity, but it's very unique to uh, the American experience. Um, so ho hopefully that was uh, helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, your friends in Calvary Chapel definitely come out of revivalism. Yeah. Yeah, which is a uniquely American form or religious practice. It's it's very powerful experience if you are part of a big crowd in an evangelist meeting and you're moved by the preaching and they invite you to come down to the altar and you do that. That's very powerful. Is that where they like lay hands and then some people are like, oh. No, that's what the Pentecost the Pentecostals <laughs> embellished it and added that. Yeah. We're happy to do that here at St. Matthew's for you. You want to receive the Holy Spirit? We'll lay hands on you. Okay. Yes. I want to make a comment about similarities and differences between those sorts of denominations and, and yeah. what we experience. In, in uh, denominations that emphasize adult baptism and making a personal decision and being baptized as an adult, those denominations very often have a service for an infant that's called the dedication of an infant. And that's when the parents and the grandparents and the church itself uh, dedicate themselves to raising this child as a Christian child, but there's no baptism at that time. Then yeah. they undergo an adult baptism by the, when they reach the age of reason or when they can make a decision for themselves. Yeah. Then compare that to, uh, as Catholics, baptizing an infant, but then having an, a service of confirmation for the young adult when they take on the responsibilities yeah. of being a Christian for themselves. So it seems to me that it's necessary to realize that there's a parallelism in the two practices, even though they're perceiving their ideology a little bit differently from one another. Yeah. So will that level of maturity hit sometime around 60 or so? <laughs> in your case, no. <laughs> in your case, I guess so. <laughs> So on page seven, uh, let's go to the, the second sacrament of initiation is called confirmation. The sacrament, confirmation, it's number two, right in confirmation. I think you have a blank there, right? Confirmation. The sacrament through which the grace of the Holy Spirit is communicated to us for ministry within the body of Christ and through which we receive the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. The minister of confirmation is the apostle of Christ, the bishop, or in special circumstances, a priest when so designated by a, the bishop. The matter of the sacrament of confirmation is the holy oil, or we call it chrism. Chrism is the word. Let me uh, spell that for you. I think I'll use oil. Yeah, it's called chrism because it is oil. but uh, it, it is anointing oil. And it's perfumed. So that is what's used. Um, chrism is what is used in confirmation. It's also used in baptism. And it's also used in ordination. So the holy oil or chrism and the form of the sacrament of confirmation are the words receive the Holy Spirit Amen. it's a command <laughs> and it comes from Jesus <laughs> then the third and final sacrament of uh, initiation is the Holy Eucharist it is a sacrament of initiation now unlike confirmation and baptism which happens only once as an event and yet the great grace continues to work in your life it's like a seed planted in you the Eucharist is a repeatable sacrament and um, uh, traditionally it's it, it's received once every seven days on the first day of the week and it further um, imparts the life of Jesus in you so that the process of transformation is a continuous thing. It is your source of life and it's re done repeatedly. Um, but it is considered a sacrament of initiation because it, it introduces you on a continuous level into the life, the spiritual life of Christ. 
The sacrament in which Christ becomes present to us and the benefits of his death upon the cross are communicated to us. That's the Holy Eucharist. In the Eucharist, we receive forgiveness of sins. We are strengthened in grace and we are nourished by the body and blood of Christ. You can add body and blood, soul and divinity. It's, it, uh, you, you're nourished by the totality of the person of Jesus. In the Eucharist, we realize communion. The word is communion, C-O-M-M-U-N-I-O-N, -M -M with God and with one another. Communion means koinonia, fellowship, or sharing a common life. In the, in the Eucharist, we offer ourselves to God, and God, through Christ, offers himself to us. The minister of the sacrament of the Eucharist is the bishop, and in the absence of the bishop, the presbyter, P-R-E-S-B-Y-T-E-R, -E -E or better known as the priest. The P-R-E-S, B as in boy, Y, T as in Tom, E-R, presbyter. It's where the word Presbyterian comes from. Okay, the matter of the sacrament of the Eucharist is what? Bread and wine. If you don't have bread and wine, you don't have the sacrament. The form of the sacrament of the Eucharist are the words, this is my body, this is the cup of my blood. That's what we call the words of institution and um, are necessary to be said in the celebration of the Eucharist as Catholics understand it. So those are the three sacraments of initiation. Two of them are only done once. The third one, the Holy Eucharist, is repeated throughout your life. In fact, many Catholics are daily communicants, aren't you, Tony? And, and so, um, so uh, the Eucharist is something that is done every day, and it can be. Okay. All right. Are, are you with me so far? Now, I want you to uh, hear, hear this very carefully. In the ancient church, when people were being baptized, first there was a period of instruction and then they were baptized. During the period of instruction, they are called catechumens, as they're being formed in the faith. Then, when they reach a certain point, then they are baptized. After they're baptized, and they're baptized naked. Um, yeah. That, and, and this is why um, um, in the early church you'll see references to deaconesses because it was the deaconesses who would baptize the women. And so you would remove whatever clothing that you have. You would enter, and baptism was by immersion in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ancient church. And then you would go through and you would be immersed three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then you would come out of the baptismal uh, pool um, and then you would be anointed with oil and a white garment would be put over you. It's called a baptismal garment. Now it was very dramatic and that's because in the ancient church it was mostly adults being baptized. But as time went on and everybody was a Christian already baptized, <laughs> you know, infant baptism became the norm. You still, the, the, there is a baptismal gown that an infant will wear. You probably still have yours in your family, the one you were baptized in. The baptismal garment is a white robe that is put on. It's called an alb. So when you see the ministers in the church wearing a white robe, it's not so they look good. <laughs> it's the baptismal garment. Now, in the ancient church, when you went to Mass or you went to the Eucharistic liturgy, usually very early on a Sunday morning, um, everybody wore their white alb the Sunday best. Mm -hmm. So the church would be filled with everyone wearing the same white garment. Um, but, uh, but very early on, say by the fourth century, people just started not doing that. And it was just the ministers who do it, th that wore the white alb. The cassock and the, surpl the surplus is the baptismal garment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the priest will wear the alb, but the, the alb is the vestment for all of the baptized. So you can come legitimately, you might, people might look at you like you're odd, but you could wear a white alb to church on Sunday morning and you're like, that's right, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I, I wanted you to know the, the white alb is the, the baptismal garment and it's still worn by the ministers in the course of the liturgy, even though the people at large don't. Yes. How does the alb differ 
go from the surplus? Um, it, you know, um, the, the white alb is the, is the most ancient garment, and it would be ankle length, and you would wear it in long sleeves. Is that what the servers wear that's, with the rope around them? Yeah, that's oh, what right. it is. That's okay. the, so wearing the baptismal garment. Um, in the Middle Ages, particularly up in the, uh, in the northern Europe where it was very cold, you know, the black cassock was just ordinary dress. It wasn't particularly religious. It went out of style, but the church still wears it, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, um, so uh, then rather than removing it because it's cold, they kept that on, and usually it was black, and then you would put a surplus over it, which is the same, which is the white thing um, that Michael wears at the 8 o'clock mass. Nowadays, a surplus has very elaborate lace. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The one thing about Catholicism, we love to embellish things. Okay. But the surplus that's worn over a cassock is really the same thing as what an alb is that's ankle length. It's, it's the baptismal garment. That's what it represents. Now, after you were baptized... Then you were anointed with oil. You were then dressed in this baptismal garment, which you were expected to wear every time you came to the Eucharistic celebration. You were given um, um, the Eucharist. This all happened like all in one movement. And the expectation was, you're not going to sin anymore, are you? You know, once you're baptized, that's it. No more sinning. It's over. <laughs> It's done. Because by being baptized, you have died, the old Steve, or the old Tony, and now you have been risen and your life doesn't belong to you anymore. You belong to God. And you have no right to commit sins anymore. You give that up. That was the expectation. And so you didn't sin. However, very early on, people began to realize, well, people still sin even after <laughs> baptism. So, we have a special sacrament for that. And these are called the sacraments of restoration and renewal. Sacraments of restoration and renewal. Number four. The fourth sacrament is the sacrament of reconciliation. The sacrament in which we receive the forgiveness of Christ for sins committed after baptism. <laughs> and of course, no one at St. Matthew sins after baptism. Because no one comes to confession. <laughs> I, I have such a righteous church. We even made the confessional into a broom closet. So we don't waste any space around here. In fact, most of the people that come to confession, which is very few, the people who do come to confession at St. Matthew's are the Protestants who are coming to St. Matthew's because they want to experience confession. But the Roman Catholics, people who grew up Roman Catholic, they never come to confession. <laughs> okay. The, the, the sacrament in which we receive the forgiveness of Christ for sins committed after baptism. The minister is the bishop or anyone the bishop designates as his representative. In most cases, it is the priest. The priest is trained to hear confessions. The matter of the sacrament of reconciliation is the presence and voice of the priest. The form of the sacrament of reconciliation are the words, I absolve you. Now look at the next handout that I gave to you. The sacrament of reconciliation. Because this is such a misunderstood sacrament, I decided to provide you with a more extended uh, explanation. Now, um, by the way, I have the uh, scripture readings on which this is built. So, um, the sacrament of reconciliation, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. The first section from the scriptures, from the gospel, states that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus himself of Nazareth has the authority to forgive sins. And Polly, would you read that for us? Yeah. Yeah. 
One day, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him for healing. And some men brought on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They were trying to bring him in and set him in his presence, but not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the tiles into the middle in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, As for you, your sins are forgiven. Then, when the scribes and Pharisees began to ask themselves, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them in reply, What are you thinking in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. He stood up immediately before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. Then astonishment seized them all, and they glorified God, and struck with awe, they said, We have seen incredible things today. So, in this story, the point that is being made is that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. At that time, the Jews, particularly the Pharisees, believed, and rightly so, only God can forgive sins. They were right. They were, their theology was absolutely correct. What didn't occur to them is that Jesus of Nazareth was God. <laughs> So we know that Jesus has the authority to uh, forgive sins. The next section, Jesus gives this authority to forgive sins to the apostles. He delegates it out. And I'd like for uh, Mother Esther Diane, if you would read that passage from John 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So you can see um, that this authority, uh, the resurrected Christ, passes on to his uh, apostles. Now we see in another uh, passage how this develops in the life of the church, presbyters minister forgiveness of sins when sins are confessed. Um, Tony, would you read that one? Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. Now, the reason I put this verse in here, it's also used um, as the scriptural basis of the anointing of the sick. but. What is important is the close association with confession and forgiveness and the presbyters. Okay, Uh, the practice of confession of sin is urged. This is also in the New Testament in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. And Steve, if you would read that for us. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. So we can see that in the early church, confession of sins was urged as a practice. Um, Also, when it says the blood of Jesus, 
Remember, in, 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 in Jewish and uh, Hebrew thinking, when you, say, when you talk about the blood, you're talking about the life. So you could easily say, the life of Jesus. Um, so you don't like separate blood with all its corpuscles away from the person of Jesus. Blood means his life, the life force in him. So, and so um, that is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, um, we are called to be ministers of reconciliation. This is what St. Paul says. And, uh, and if you would, uh, Kristen, read that passage. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the, minist the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So you can see that part of the ministry of the church is this notion of reconciliation, confession, and the forgiveness of sins. If you turn the page over, we have an introduction to the rite of reconciliation. Now, I, uh, <clears throat> the purpose of the sacrament of reconciliation, Nancy, would you read that? The sacrament of re reconciliation is a pastoral ministry entrusted by Christ to the church for the purpose of providing an Appropriating. Appropriating the grace of forgiveness for sins committed after baptism. The sacrament of reconciliation is an extension and application of the grace we first received in our baptism for the removal of sins and guilt and for the impartation of new life, which is understood in the resurrection of the proper relationship between the personal relationship between God and the particular human person who has been created in the image of God. So when you go to confession, there are certain steps in which this is practice. And there, the first thing is you should, ought to prepare yourself for the celebration of the rite of reconciliation. That begins with an examination of conscience. Meredith, would you like to read that? As you prepare to make a good confession, you want to ask God's forgiveness for any way in which you have offended him, but particularly for any serious sin. If you are not certain what you should bring to the priest in confession, do not be afraid to ask him for help. The priest is there to assist you and to share with you God's love and mercy. Why don't you go on and read the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments. Many people find the Ten Commandments to be a good frame of reference for an examination of conscience. The commandments are listed here as a reminder that you might find helpful. One, I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. Two, you shall not make anything an idol for yourself. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Four, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Five, honor your, your father and your mother. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Nine, you shall not steal. Or, I'm sorry, that was eight. <laughs> Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And 10, you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's spouse or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Go ahead with the, the other three. The greatest commandment. Jesus said, thou shalt love thy Lord, the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt, lo thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The golden rule. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The rule of love. Whatever is not of love is sin. And love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So this examination of conscience is a very simple one. is a way of reviewing and taking an inventory of your life where you might have violated any of these things. Now, in... Um, uh, historic Christianity, especially as it developed within Catholicism, 
there is a distinction made between two kinds of sins. There is what is called mortal sin. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Mortal sin, bad news. And then <laughs> venial sins, sins that are not so bad. Um, and it's interesting that in the first letter of John in the New Testament, there is reference made to this. And he says, there is such a thing as mortal sin. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not mortal. Okay, so based on that, this is what uh, has developed over time in the understanding of the church. So, a mortal sin is a grave and intentional act in violation of one's conscience and the universal law of love. Mortal sin destroys the relationship between the divine life and the soul of the human person, as well as the relationship of love between a person and another person or group of persons. For a sin to be mortal, three conditions must be present. It must be a grave matter, full knowledge of the evil of the act, in other words, it has to be intentionally done, and full consent of the will. It is to choose deliberately, that is both knowing it and willing it, something gravely contrary to the divine law of love. Unaddressed, mortal sin can lead to eternal death, or what is called the second death, which is the eternal separation of the human soul from God. This is often referred to as being in a state of hell, and that's a state of the soul, not a physical location under the earth, which is the ultimate consequence of mortal sin. So mortal sin needs to be dealt with. It is destructive of one's spiritual life. Then there is what we call venial sins. You've heard of venial sins? Mm -hmm. I, I, I call this the sins of weakness, you know? Um, according to the Roman Catechism, venial sins does not destroy the divine life in the soul as does mortal sin, though it diminishes it and wounds it. Venial sin is a failure to observe necessary moderation in lesser matters of the moral law, or in grave matters acting without full knowledge or complete consent. We must realize, however, that while venial sins do not have the grave effects of mortal sin, deliberate and unrepented venial sin disposes us little by little to commit mortal sin. It should be the goal of every Christian to strive through steadfast prayer, acts of penance, and works of charity for a life free of all sin. So, and there's big debates <laughs> among moral theologians as to what constitutes a mortal sin and a venial sin. It's nice to say there's a difference, but then this, uh, to uh, zero in on particular acts. So, um, it's one thing to look at pornography. It's another thing to commit adultery. Do you see the difference? Yeah. yeah. It's not good to look at pornography because little by little, it can then lead to acting out in a way that would really be a grave sin. Do you see? So this is the way the church has tried to make these distinctions. Um, getting mad at your wife because she's pointed out some truth about your own behavior <laughs> may be a venial sin, but murdering your wife is truly a mortal sin. Okay. The right for the reconciliation of individual penitence. And here's the right. If you wanted to know what mysterious thing occurs in the confessional, here it is. Okay? The preparation of the priest and penitent. Uh, and this is where I'd like to have Polly read that one. Here you go, Polly. Priest and penitent should first prepare themselves by prayer to celebrate the sacrament. The priest should call upon the Holy Spirit so that he may receive enlightenment and charity. The penitent should compare his life with the example and commandments of Christ and then pray to God for the forgiveness of his sins. Okay, uh, Diane, if you would uh, read the instruction to the priest welcoming the penitent. The priest should welcome the penitent with fraternal charity and if the occasion permits, address him with friendly words. 
The penitent makes the sign of the cross, saying, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The priest may also make the sign of the cross with the penitent. Next, the priest briefly urges the penitent to have confidence in God. If the penitent is unknown to the priest, it is proper for him to indicate his state of life, the time of his last confession, his difficulties in leading the Christian life, and anything else which may help the confessor in exercising his ministry. So the penitent will say, Bless me, Father, or Mother. Yeah, if you're in our church. <laughs> for I have sinned. It has been a very long time <laughs> since my last confession. And then the priest says, May the Lord be upon your heart and upon your lips, that you may make a good and sincere confession of your sins. Then there's the reading of scripture, and Tony, if you would just read that instruction there. Then the priest or the penitent himself may read a text of holy scripture, or this may be done as part of the preparation for the sacrament, through Jesus, who is the word of God, whom scripture bears witness. The Christian receives light to recognize one's own sins and is called to conversion and to confidence in God's mercy. Confessions of sins and the act of penance. Steve. The penitent then confesses his sins beginning where customary with a form of general confession. I confess to Almighty God. If necessary, the priest should help the penitent to make a complete confession. He or she should also encourage the penitent to have a sincere sorrow for their sins against God. Finally, the priest should offer suitable counsel to help the penitent begin a new life and, where necessary, instruct him in the duties of a Christian way of life. If the penitent has been the cause of harm or scandal to others, the priest should lead him to the resolve that he will make appropriate restitution. Then the priest prescribes an act of penance or satisfaction on the penitent. This should serve not only to make up for the past, but also to help him to begin a new life and provide him with an antidote to weakness. As far as possible, the penance should correspond to the seriousness and the nature of the sins. This act of penance may suitably take the form of prayer, self-denial, and especially service of one's neighbor and works of mercy. These will underline the fact that sin and forgiveness have a social aspect. So I'll give you um, um, a kind of a, a, an example. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I want you to know that a priest is bound by what is called the seal of the confessional, strict secrecy. This is uh, so that the penitent um, can have trust that his wrongdoing is not going to be broadcasted and talked about. So, And uh, a priest who would reveal whatever's told him in a confessional, um, the consequence of that is that his faculties, his authority to minister is removed. It's a very serious offense. Um, so, um, uh, this way people can have confidence that even though they're going to the priest for confession, um, they're, they're, they don't have to have anything to fear that it gets out. Um, in the um, ancient church, um, people would conf be required to confess their sins to the whole congregation. Now, uh, if the congregation was, mat was spiritually mature, maybe that would work and be a very healing thing. If you've been in certain groups where there's safety in a group, that can, that can happen. But that's usually not the case. So, it, 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 so on a very practical level, there was a problem. So that very early on, the church realized that um, it's better that someone is designated a confessor that people can go to that protects people. Otherwise, people won't be confessing their sins because they sometimes are abused by the community when they do so. So, um, so that happened. 
then the, uh, then the Irish um, priests um, who were very prominent in the uh, late or in the early Middle Ages in the uh, 600, 700, 800s, um, they developed the practice of the confessional because even being seen confessing to a priest could be compromising. So the confessional is a place uh, where uh, you can remain anonymous and yet still receive the grace of the sacrament and uh, confess your sins. So you can see the practice of reconciliation has changed through time. It used to be up until Vatican II that you went into a little box and you knelt and the priest was on the other side of a screen. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, but after Vatican II, that was still an option. You could still do that or you could just go face to face with a priest. In the Eastern Church, there's no confessional boxes. Uh, you visit the priest at, at, in the church, and the priest stands at your side, and you both face the altar, and you make your confessions, and the priest is a witness that you're making the confession. Mm -hmm. So there's different ways of doing that. As far as giving uh, penance, um, and, and uh, something I, uh, I've done different things, um, uh, but one example of what I did, um, someone came to me, uh, a young man, um, who wanted to confess. He was a man in his late 20s by this time, but he wanted to confess, and he bore this on his soul, and it never went away. Guilt's a problem, it, and people have a hard time dealing with guilt. It's one of the most difficult emotions that anyone can deal with, because once it's, it's, it's like a monkey on your back that you can't get off. So people can go for a lifetime feeling extreme guilt. Guilt serves an important purpose. It's like an alarm that goes off. I have violated my conscience. You need to know that and do something about it. But the problem is that people just carry this heavy burden of guilt around. This particular young man in his late 20s uh, came to me for uh, confession and he was feeling guilty for years. Uh, because he had violated his conscience when he was a, a, a young teenage boy. He was an altar boy in the church, and when the offering was taken, he was the altar boy that would collect the baskets and take them to the sacristy, and he would pocket the money. Life went on, but he could never escape the guilt of what he was feeling and the shame that he had. So he finally decided to come to confession. So I heard his confession as he told me this. So then I said to him that for his penance, because this is a very serious offense. I said, for your penance, I want you to be a ser an altar server again and be the server that gets the money and brings it to the sacristy. You're gonna do this again, and you're gonna do it for a year. And so he came to St. Matthew's, and he was a server for a year. He filled out his penance, and he was responsible for taking the basket of money to the sacristy. This was in a different building where the sacristy was right near the altar area, just went off to the side and went, went into it. And he was shocked that I would do that. But I am absolutely certain he wouldn't take another penny from the church. But it put him back into that. You see how that works? It, it's about restoration and doing something to make amends. That, that, that's what penance is. So I know people jokingly say, oh, say five Hail Marys and three Our Father. Well, the, the reason those are said is that um, um, sin begins in the human heart and prayer is the antidote. So you get people praying for their penance. In other words, you set them back on the path of living a devout life. So it's not like you just say that number and you're done. It's, the idea is that that will get you back in the habit of doing that again. Prayer is a great antidote to avoiding sin. Mm -hmm. If you have an active prayer life, you'll sin less. It's just something But it, it is that good, we have like with that penance that you had him do something that he really could feel in his heart that in some way maybe made up for. Yeah. You know, to show that he, you know, there is, you know, he can That's right. It's, it's a right restitution. It's, it's making amends, right. which is part of it. Uh, as Jesus said to the woman that he freely forgave of adultery, he said, go and sin no more. Or actually, it, it's translated... Uh, uh, go and from now on avoid this particular sin. <laughs> it almost got you stoned. <laughs> yes. But in, in addition to just going through that process, the Holy Spirit is actually at work during that during that Absolutely. sacrament. That's right. 
and and so as a, a, as a minister of that sacrament, I'm very conscious of that and of the importance to give a penance that makes sense to to the penitent. So it's interesting. I, I had a friend explain to me the weight of our decisions in, in a pretty simple term. I, I've used it before, but it's a uh, an association to those decisions and those sins and gravity and how we plot along our day and it just piles up that gravity of it yeah. and you try to just put it away and you try to just keep moving on and I think what and this this um, sacrament I've asked many times even being raised Catholic I got kind of like oh come on now I don't need to go talk to this man about it but I've, yeah. lo I've, I've re um, I've come around to the reality that it's not about it's a, it's an opportunity to pray, yeah, and to really work on yourself in that, and it's, it facilitates that. And I have an aunt yeah. who used to say that all the time, but you've got to release yourself of the gravity or the weight of those decisions, yeah. and it's a way that the, the the community has allowed us to do that. Yeah, and it, so the sacrament of reconciliation and the way you describe it becomes something that liberates you. It, rather than being a negative experience, the idea is it's to be a positive experience. You feel restored. You're able to let go of it. Also, the priest is standing in the place of Christ. That's all. The priest is a witness and is giving you the words of Jesus. That's what the priest is doing. And, and so when the priest absolves you from your sin, it, 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 you have a point in time in which you heard the words, you are forgiven. I absolve you of these sins, which is the voice of Christ speaking, but you heard a voice from the minister of Christ. That's a powerful thing because you can now point back to a time because if the guilt comes back again over that, you can say, wait a minute, I confessed it and God has forgiven me. It, 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 you can see the good psychology and the good spiritual practice of it. Confession is it really it, it should be a positive and healing experience. Notice how the instruction emphasizes for the priest to be friendly and charitable, because not all priests are. Gosh, I've heard nightmare stories, and I know why some Catholics never go back to the confessional, because it was a very painful experience, because there was a minister or a priest who was abusive in the way he implemented it, you know, very condemning and, you know. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, uh, okay, the prayer of the penitent and absolution by the priest. Who are we at? Are we? Kristen. After this, the penitent manifests his contrition and resolution to begin a new life by means of a prayer for God, God's pardon. It is desirable that this prayer should be based on the words of Scripture. Why don't you go ahead and read for us the act of contrition. You might remember this I've prayer. I have memorized this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Wait, where are we? Okay. Just make sure. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended. I'm going to my routine. Yeah. <laughs> Not routine, but what I memorized. <laughs> having offended you, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all because they offend you, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help of your grace to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. There you go. Do you say that to the priest every time for confession? Or? You had to, I just remember yeah, memorizing Catholics it. Catholics are raised to memorize it, and they would say that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. That's an example. It's a very traditional prayer, but, you know, you, you could, it doesn't have to be those particular words, but that's an example. Yeah, we had to memorize it, and it had, to, and then we were, it was drilled into to me as a Catholic child that you absolutely, this is what you said, and you absolutely had to say it exactly this way, or you were going yeah. to hell, and it was like, this is what you must do. Yeah. <laughs> it was also useful if you found yourself in a really tight spot and things were not going as well as you might have hoped. You could just say this and, you know, it put you on a smoother path to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a, you know, like an American. It was like a last ditch. 
<laughs> well, yeah, especially if you are in fear of your life, people will often wouldn't say they're acting contra just in case. <laughs> you know. Okay, uh, go ahead, uh, Kristen, read the next paragraph. Um, following this prayer, the priest extends his hands, or at least his right hand, over the head of the penitent and pronounces the formula of absolution in which the essential words are, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, then then if, read the next paragraph, Kristen. Okay. As he or she says the final words, the priest makes the sign of the cross over the penitent. The form of absolution indicates that the reconciliation of the penitent comes from the mercy of the Father. It shows the connection between the reconciliation of the sinner and the paschal mystery of Christ. It stresses the role of the Holy Spirit in the forgiveness of sins. Finally, it underlines the ecl uh, ec ecclesial. ecclesial aspect of the sacrament uh, because reconciliation with God is asked for and given through the ministry of, church, of the church. Great, very good. Um, now, Nancy, if you would read the next. Pro proclamation of praise and dismissal of the penitent. After receiving pardon for his sins, the penitent praises the mercy of God and gives him thanks in a short invocation taken from scripture. Then the priest tells him to go in peace. The penitent continues his conversion and expresses it by a life renewed according to the gospel and more, and gospel and more and more steeped in the love of God. For love covers over a multiple multitude of sins. There you go. We won't read the shorter, right? It's just a uh, condensed form. So you see kind of how that sacrament is celebrated and how it's supposed to work. Um, any questions about that? Okay, as you know, Jesus' uh, ministry involved healing. In fact, most of his miracles were healing uh, miracles. And we have the fifth sacrament, which is one of the sacraments of restoration and renewal, the anointing of the sick. So we'll fill in your, uh, your blank there. The anointing of the sick is number five. The anointing of the sick. The sacrament in which the healing ministry of Christ is conveyed to us to restore us to wholeness in soul and body. The minister of the sacrament of healing is the bishop and or the priest. The matter of the sacrament uh, of healing is the oil of the sick. The oil is the word. The oil of the sick. The form of the sacrament of healing are the words, may the Lord raise you up, okay? Then the final two sacraments that we have of the, of the seven are what we call the sacraments of vocation. The sacraments of vocation. Remember vocational school? <laughs> your living, your daily life, the sacraments uh, of that to a, a lifestyle. And there are two of those. Number six, holy orders. The sacrament by which an individual is set apart by the Holy Spirit for the ministerial, the word is ministerial priesthood. Ministerial priesthood of which there are three priestly ministries. And they are bishop, priest, and deacon. The action of setting apart is called ordination. So ordination is a sacrament. The minister of the sacrament of holy orders is the bishop of Lone. The matter of the sacrament of holy orders is the laying on of hands by the bishop. The laying on of hands by the bishop. The form of the sacrament of holy orders are the words of the prayer of, of ordination. Then finally, number seven, the second sacrament of vocation is matrimony. The sacrament where the lives of two people are joined into one in a sacred union. The two lives become one. The ministers of the sacrament of matrimony are the bride and the bridegroom. It's not the priest. So it, it's incorrect for me to say, oh yeah, I, 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 I married so-and-so. No, I didn't. I just was there as a witness. Okay? The purpose of the priest is to bear witness of the vows and then, the, and then on behalf of the church to bless the couple. But it's the couple, the bride and groom, who are the ministers of the sacrament of matrimony. You give it to each other if you're a married couple. 
You mean the state doesn't actually do No, the state has nothing to do. All the state is doing, all the state is doing, in fact, you know, for, is the state is giving legal protection to the married couple. That's all it's doing. And at one time, it was, it, it was illegal to violate um, a, a marriage. And adultery was a crime at one time because that's a violation. Or someone who disrespects another's marriage vows and tries to, you know, to um, proposition one of, the, one of the spouses. That used to be illegal behavior, not anymore. Um, but I gotta tell you, it, it, um, it is one of the most, uh, uh, adultery I found to be one of the most painful experiences that people experience, you know. It, it's always a great tragedy when it happens. <clears throat> um, okay, so um, the bride and bride, the matter of the sacrament of matrimony are the bodies of the two joined in sexual union. So there is something sacred about the relationship between two individuals in the context of marriage. The form of the sacrament of matrimony is the expression of unconditional love. And permanent and exclusive commitment which are expressed in the marriage vows. Uh, it is the expression of unconditional love and permanent exclusive commitment, the marriage vows. So there you, there you have the seven sacraments of the, of the church. I'm sorry to keep you over, but it was kind of important to go over all this material. <clears throat> Any questions about what we reviewed so far? Okay, great. Thank you for allowing me to keep you over. I think we got started late, didn't we? Okay. Okay, good.